The focus of my talk today is just to introduce myself to you and to talk about sort of the diversity of research that I do and ecosystems that I work in and things like that. I kind of um, put my thumb in lots of different pies. I do a you know, ground-based remote sensing and computational modeling, have been involved with you know, analyzing big data and long-term data sets, field experiments um, all across the you know, central and western United States and a lot of different ecosystem types. So I come from, I grew up in Kansas. Uh, my family raises cows in northeastern Kansas, just outside Kansas City. So I have some experience with rangeland science, although things are quite a bit different here than there. So I did my undergrad and my master's at the University of Kansas. I was in the environmental studies program and then in the department of geography. And from there, I moved to the biology department at the University of New Mexico. And then I postdoc um, at the University of Wyoming, but was actually on the Northern Arizona University campus working for the US Geological Survey. So that was kind of a complicated thing. So I'm happy to just be in one place at one time now here at New Mexico State um, and working with um, you guys with ARS and with the LTER. So my research interest is really how biophysical interactions operate through time to influence the things that we see on a landscape or how we know that a landscape works. So I'm interested in concepts like ecological state transitions or sort of how a forest ecosystem regenerates or how grasslands in, you know, the Eastern Great Plains differ in their functionality from grasslands in the Western Great Plains. So I'm really interested in questions about, you know, how does carbon storage happen in these ecosystems? How does carbon storage differ when you have an ecological state transition from a grassland to a shrubland? Um, what are the underlying mechanisms in terms of, of climate and temperature and precipitation that really cause, you know, the driving mechanisms to happen in these systems. So I do um, quite a bit of, of biophysical modeling, both low dimensional statistical modeling and then also more complex um, computational mechanistic modeling. Um, eddy covariance based remote sensing is something I really like to be involved with. I think it's an interesting tool. And then, like I was saying before, big manipulative experiments when I can get my hands on them. And I'm interested in how the information produced by these different research techniques can actually be integrated in order for us to get sort of a perspective on how things work at these sort of intermediate landscape scales at which we manage these ecosystems. So I'm just going to talk over the next few slides just about some of the things that I've been doing over the last few years. And feel free to, to stop me at any point if you have any questions. I'm just kind of providing a snapshot of these different things um, without really a, a specific goal in mind or anything like that. So one of my dissertation chapters a few years ago, at, um, I was working at the Sevilla National Wildlife Refuge in the, the former LTER there, was to use sort of long-term above ground and below ground productivity data and eddy covariance data, soil moisture data to sort of tease apart how does the interaction between gross primary production, which is carbon going into a system, and ecosystem respiration, which is the carbon going out of the system, differ between sort of at the Sevieta, there's this sort of this border between established, you know, 50 to 75 year old creosote shrubland and mixed grassland of blue and black grandma. And in this research, we were able to sort of better characterize how even at, you know, so we're looking at soil moisture on the x-axis and, you know, Bowen ratio, which is just energy partitioning in the system and then different um, carbon flux dynamics in these systems. How does, you know, when it's wet, how does, you know, net ecosystem exchange in a grassland essentially sequester more carbon than that of a shrubland? But then as, you know, you reach you know, somewhere around 12% soil moisture that's normalized between these systems. How does that shrubland go towards being 
a greater carbon sink than that grassland. And what does that mean over multiple years of climate variability? Well, ultimately what we discovered is, is sort of the proportion of wet and dry years through time creates a situation where a creosote shrubland continues to sequester carbon as above ground biomass, whereas a grassland alternates between a source and a sink from year to year. And one of the major components of that at least in that northern grassland, is um, we actually will see when grasses desiccate that they can actually be essentially cooked by radiation from the sun and they can lose carbon as an aerosol. And so there was you know, an interesting part of the carbon budget is that grasses don't just necessarily lose carbon through respiration, but they can also physically lose carbon when they desiccate, just the above ground biomass breaks down. So that was you know, something that I'm interested in. Um, additionally, at the Seviet, and this is, these are kind of difficult figures, we were, I was playing around with the eddy covariance data and was looking at patterns of rainfall in the grasslands. And so the x-axis here is just the average number of events per day and then the alpha value is the depth per event and we just sort of fit a linear model to these data to sort of see how does this is above ground. Well, it's, it's an ecosystem exchange, you know, sort of fit to these precipitation variables. And we saw that there was a pretty low threshold above which, you know, um, grasslands begin to take up quite a bit of carbon once you get into this sort of two to four millimeter rainfall event range. And so, being interested in that, I designed an experiment where during a dry year in 2012, we removed all the small rainfall events from a treatment grassland here. And then in 2013, which just so happened to be a wet year, um, we added the same number of events to make up for that proportion in the wet year to see if we could sort of tease apart what were the legacy influences of these really small events. And we really found, you know, in our dry year in 2012 when productivity was low, what happened when we removed these small events is we caused grassland senescence and there wasn't as much nitrogen or living meristems within the treatment grassland at the end of 2012. And that legacy effect carried over into 2013 to where even the grassland that received supplemental small rainfall events didn't have the productivity the following year. So that's something that I'm also interested in and that I'll be doing some research on here is just, you know, do, A, do we have the data to, you know, assess these legacy effects? What are the legacy effects? And can we really trace legacy effects to, you know, future climate scenarios and things like that. You know, what can we find out from these really great long-term data sets that we have? Um, I'm also interested in woodland and forest systems and also sort of using, you know, using long-term data, especially ecophysiological data, to sort of design and constrain um, simulation models. So this was a project that I took on with um, the Pachman Lab at the University of New Mexico. This is, he has the sort of famous experiment where he has the huge rain out structures of pinyon juniper woodland. Is everybody familiar more or less with this? It's, it's multiple acres of sort of rainfall addition and rainfall removal treatments. And the cool thing is, is he has a lot of trees instrumentized within these tre within these treatments, so we know you know sort of what sap flow, what is you know soil moisture. We can get measurements of of tree water use efficiency and gas exchange and things like this. And that's really great data to sort of parameterize the functioning of these trees in different sites. You know, between pinyon and juniper, between upslope and downslope, to sort of elucidate how they function in response to changes in moisture availability and things like that. So using a, a low dimensional model, which just focuses on capturing sort of the climate inputs, the water balance and the vegetation functioning, um, we're sort of able to, what I did with these simulations is change the way the winter precipitation happened. 
So I increased temperature to essentially um, mimic greater melting of snow. So these systems usually in northern New Mexico receive some snow that can accumulate over winter and then melt in the spring. And we're kind of sitting right at a threshold in a lot of these systems where um, as things get warmer, it's not going to take too much of an average increase in temperature to have more melting of snow and to have basically greater variability in spring um, moisture. And what we think will happen using simulations of you know, increasing temperature through time and doing lots of iterations is that we're going to move towards having you know, greater carbon assimilation and greater you know, carbon reserves in these systems, especially in the pinion trees, and a greater reduction in the carbon stores and transpiration and moisture availability um, in the late spring and really early summer. Really small changes, but possibly important changes for, you know, especially these pinion trees, which are really susceptible to drought, entering potentially drier summers, drier early summer growing seasons with, you know, greater, with lesser carbon reserves. Um, a lot of my postdoc research has also been on, on trees, and specifically, I talked about this when I was here in July, uh, focusing on using sort of more of a high-dimensional um, land surface ecosystem water balance model um, to, coupled with sort of ecophysiological criteria that govern um, tree regeneration, so the different stages of cone production and ponderosa pine and tree sprouting and then survival for the first few years across ecosystems in the western United States to sort of see how the different stages sort of such as tree flowering and cone development, um, germination, seedling survival, and then juvenile survival will be influenced by warmer temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, so we're linking um, our ecosystem water balance model to future climate scenarios and different concentration pathways and things like that. And we're, we're seeing that, you know, with the limited data that we have that really adds a lot of uncertainty, we're seeing potentially greater you know, regeneration potential in the southwestern United States compared to the rest of the U.S., mostly because the ponderosa pine, the semi-arid forests in the southwestern U.S. are already living at a higher elevation. They've already sort of experienced that vertical migration over the last, you know, 10 or 20,000 years that will allow them to exist in a relatively cooler climate compared to their neighbors, you know, throughout the northwest or the upper Rocky Mountain region. Um, in the coming hundred years or so, potentially um, having a greater potential for maintaining, you know, semi-arid tree populations, things like that. And there's still a lot of uncertainty in this research. We're hoping to continue it over the next few years. Um, back to grasslands for a minute. I also like to work on synthesis projects. This is a synthesis project from eight different grassland types, not getting all the way down to the Hornada, but it's just more Great Plains grassland types from Sevietta up through Lethbridge in Canada and um, a grassland in, in Illinois and Kansas and Eastern Kansas and things like this to sort of see using eddy covariance data what are the energy balance and soil moisture characteristics that, uh, that govern you know, carbon balance within these grasslands. And what this figure illustrates is net ecosystem exchange on the x-axis, so zero, if you're negative, you're taking up carbon into the grassland system. Um, and on the y-axis, it's evaporative fraction, so it's how much of incoming solar radiation is being used to evaporate water, where 1.0 would be 100% a really wet condition, you know, a, a wet day in July when you're going gangbusters. And we found that you in especially these eastern mesic systems, what really governs the carbon balance is this sort of month or you know 45 days where you are are wet in the summer and your grassland takes up a lot of carbon. If you have these days, you're going to be a carbon sink in your year. If you don't have those days, you know if you're 
experiencing a drought that year. That's really the thing that's going to co govern carbon balance more so than respiration, which is a little bit more uniform year to year and things like that. Those things tend to fall apart when you get into, you know, the Western Great Plains or, you know, something, a place like the Sevilla, probably the Hornada as well, um, where you have a much more, you know, pulse dynamic system and you're really responding to the, you know, large rain events and the periods in between them. So that's something else I'm interested in here. Um, I've been here about a month and have started working with, um, working on sort of another project with multiple grasslands, sort of a synthesis project to look at long-term measurements of above ground production and link them to your know, periods of wet and dry conditions to see what the legacy effects are. And this figure showing mesic grasslands where we're looking at the growing season precipitation anomaly and consecutive wet and dry growing seasons. In mesic grasslands, we're doing this for semi-arid and desert grasslands as well. And just seeing, you know, what are the variables, you know, we haven't measured that many, we have precipitation and above ground production, but what are the variables that sort of govern what happens with these, with above ground production in these grasslands as we move from, you know, a dry year to a little bit drier to not quite as dry but really low above ground production, you know, all the way through time. Can we tease apart these legacy effects with long term data? Um, what are the important variables that we need to know? And what can we find out about your know, change in, you know, monthly or seasonal or annual rainfall um, in terms of, of climate change or, you know, management of these grasslands to sort of support productivity in them and to predict where we might have problems and where we might not. And I believe that's all I've got for you guys, so um, you just have to let me know if you have any questions.